Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Monday the 20th of February. Now, we had been led to believe that messenger RNA vaccines only stayed in the blood for a very short period of time. But we're going to be looking at work from Denmark today, not from New Zealand, not from Canada, not from the UK, not from the United States, where you might expect this sort of work to be done because this is where the large producers are, especially in the United States. But this works from Denmark and it shows that 9.3% of people that were injected with these vaccines still had the messenger RNA, the ribonucleic acid, in their blood after 28 days. This is way longer than anyone had expected. It actually took the researchers by surprise. Now, it's actually from this paper here, um, from a Danish journal. Uh, the authors are based in Copenhagen. Uh, Peer-reviewed, of course. The full paper is there, and it's available for free uh, download. I've downloaded the full PDF there, so check it out for yourself. As always, make sure I'm not making it up. Look at the original sources. I always put them in the description. So SARS coronavirus 2 spike mRNA vaccines sequences. So this is the mRNA vaccine mRNA sequence required to produce or synthesize the spike protein within the body's own cells 28 days after vaccination. Now, um, largely based at Copenhagen. Now, it's very important these days, unfortunately, um, to look at the conflicts of interest. And these authors reported no conflicts of interest. So this is the way it should be in all scientific work or scientific papers we would expect the authors to have no conflicts of interest unfortunately that's not always the case um denmark used the pfizer and moderna vaccines mrna vaccines and as we know uh, both code for production of full length sars coronavirus 2 spike protein so we're not giving the spike protein itself we're giving the messenger rna that goes into the body's own cells the body's own cells produce the spike protein. And the mRNA is encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle. We know they're in lipid nanoparticles, and we've been told quite categorically that these lipid nanoparticles are non replicating. That's been told to us many, many times that these do not replicate. And yet these ones were in the blood 28 days after vaccination the paper doesn't say they replicate not at all uh, let's hope they don't um, the modified nucleotide sequences allowed perfect identification of the vaccine sequence now in other words the rna that we're given the vaccine is um, quite a lot different from the rna in the virus that codes for the spike protein therefore the researchers were able to di diagnose definitively that this was a vaccine-induced spike protein and it didn't come from natural infection. So that is uh, absolutely clear from the study. Patients with chronic hepatitis C virus infections they were looking at. Now, these patients had received the mRNA vaccines. And to monitor the hepatitis C uh, infection, mRNA was extracted from these patients, from their plasma. So... Um, both the hepatitis C virus and the SARS coronavirus 2 have a similar a ribonucleic acid. It's both what we call a positive single stranded RNA uh, virus. So, their equipment that was designed to pick up the hepatitis C uh, RNA actually picked up the SARS CoV 2 RNA as well. So, it's almost an incidental finding. Why haven't researchers in Pfizer or Moderna, for example, been looking for this? If they have, uh, I've never seen it. Uh, and the researchers haven't seen it either. So um, that, that's how it came about. There were just, um, there were just ba basically just a coincidental, coincidental finding. Um, patients with chronic hepatitis C, as we said. So now the, the, the data there is uh, 10 out of 108 patients sampled. They found full length or traces of SARS coronavirus to vaccine sequences in the blood at 28 days. Really quite, um, I think this is quite a significant finding, of course, which is why I'm, why I'm looking at the study. So 28 days is much longer than we had thought or been led to believe by relevant authorities. Now, um, 
in Denmark, um, we would actually expect less vaccine in the blood, if anything. Now, the reason for this is uh, aspiration. So um, in Denmark, when they stick the needle into their patient, they just draw back quickly to see if they're in a blood vessel or not. Uh, in the UK, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, United States, we don't bother. And it's vitally important because if you go into a blood vessel by mistake, let me just show you what um, let me just show you what happens. So if you go into a blood vessel by mistake, then the tip of the needle ends up in a blood vessel, and then when you draw back, you immediately see blood coming into the syringe, and then you know not to inject. Uh, this is called aspiration. You can see you're in a blood vessel. So in that case, if you're in a blood vessel, you absolutely would not <laughs> give an intra venous uh, or intra-arterial or intravascular injection of, um, of the vaccine. So in Denmark, they're doing that check, the, the drawing back, but we're not. We don't bother. Um, frustrating, but true. Now, um, we had previously talked to Professor Niels Hoiby, uh, leading doctor and medical academic in uh, Denmark. And it was Professor Hoiby who actually... Uh, advised the Danish authorities to change the protocol to include aspiration. After this, the, uh, the Danish authorities, the nursing authorities, the medical authorities, all issued this as a decree, this is being done in Denmark. Pretty well thanks to Professor Hoiby's uh, intervention, and he was also, as you see there, kind enough to come on the video and uh, talk to us about it. And I will uh, put the link, uh, that, that, that's the link there actually, Professor Hoiby, but I'll, I'll post that link at the end so anyone who wants to look at it can. So that's the main thing of this uh, this talk, really. Um, that um, th this the mRNA is found twenty eight days after after the injection had been given. Now, what I'm going to do now is go on and give you a few more details for those that want a bit more information about this. So this is extra information that the uh, the researchers uh, gave in their article. So in their introduction, they said, upon intramuscular injection, the vaccine mRNA is taken up by the muscle and the immune cells. And this will be the case in Denmark because they aspirate, so it's not gone into a blood vessel. So, they would expect, so in Denmark, if anything, you would expect less RNA in the blood because you wouldn't have occasional inadvertent intravascular administrations because they correctly aspirate to their great uh, credit. Anyway, uh, that's transported to the regional lymph nodes, which, of course, in this case, are under the, uh, under the armpit, um, and concentrated in the spleen. So there is systemic absorption anyway, because the, uh, the mRNA actually uh, goes into the spleen as well, which, of course, is in the abdomen. Now, the, the vaccine consists of non-replicating mRNA, we're told. So what we would have to assume... If the virus, if the vaccine, if the um, RNA is not replicating, then it must have persisted in the blood for 28 days. Absolutely incredible in what 9.3% of patients. Now, 9.3% might not, not sound a lot, but if it turned out this was associated, say, with more vaccine complications, then that's a huge percentage. And this simply hasn't been looked at. Quite an outrageous failure to research what is going on, in my view. Um, so it's expected to naturally decompose both within the cytosol, that's within the cells, after translation. That translation means that when the RNA is converted into the spike protein and at the injection site. Half-life of mRNA uh, after translation estimated from hours to days uh, with no virus, no RNA rather being detected after 10 days. Uh, that's what we were told, but clearly not the case. Now, just to show this, this is the CDC-affiliated site here, uh, Infectious Diseases Society of America. Check it out. This is what they're saying. That's the link there. Vaccine, the mRNA is degraded quickly. Well, it would appear not. It would appear that the Infectious Diseases Society of America is either wrong or strangely inconsistent with the actual scientific empirical data that's being collected in Denmark time for them to do the studies or admit negligence uh, in my view uh, by normal intracellular processes there's no evidence for long life uh, detection of mRNA vaccines well again uh, it appears they're wrong unless this work from Denmark is wrong 
but it is a very good paper from Denmark. So I suspect the uh, Infectious Diseases Society of America has not done this work. Therefore, these public declarations, if they haven't done the work, these public declarations can be based on nothing more than speculation. How dare they speculate about such things without actually having done the work? This really is quite, in my view, quite appalling that they would do this. They would say things if they'd simply, if they don't know. You know we, we don't guess in this field, we have to know. Now, the methodology in Denmark, um, genotyping of whole RNA genome sequences, which is what they're doing, looking for, as I've said, for the uh, hepatitis uh, C virus, um, which incidentally they're able to eradicate quite remarkable uh, effective antiviral treatment if it's done properly. Um, so, so they're looking for the uh, for, for the hepatitis C virus and the SARS coronavirus two uh, mRNA, and almost the SARS coronavirus two RNA came up almost uh, incidentally, directly from blood samples. Um, we described the unexpected findings of SARS coronavirus two. They didn't expect to find this, so this was a surprise. They were looking for the hepatitis. Uh, now they run five uh, consecutive sequencing runs so they did it five times it wasn't just a fluke and uh, this was from May 21 to the end of June 2021 and uh, they had also had five negative controls and five uh, hepatitis C virus um, positive controls so this is essentially a controlled study five controls that are hep C positive five controls that are hep C negative so it's not an effect of the hep C and they did it five times so they, they know the results are accurate um, results. Both mRNA vaccine sequences have been modified. So but when we say both, we mean the Pfizer and the Moderna. So the uh, the sequences that code for the spike protein are only about 70% similar in the vaccine to what they are in the actual uh, infection itself. So in other words, there's big differences between the RNA for spike protein in the infection and the mRNA for spike protein in the vaccine. So they can clearly tell the difference. This was not uh, a fact, uh, this was not an after effect of infection. This was definitely, definitively an after effect of the uh, vaccine. And that is uh, confirmed. Um, only 70% identical to the spike protein reference genome on nucleotide level. So 70% similarity. The genetics are different. Um, the reason that they did this with the manufacturer, the vaccine manufacturers wanted to stabilize the. Uh, their molecule somewhat that's why it's different um, making it distinct from the circulating uh, infectious SARS coronavirus 2 sequences so that's definitely true as we say 108 patients that were being treated of hepatitis C 10 samples came back positive 9.3 percent so this should have been done on a large scale by uh, after other vaccination and given that we're still giving these vaccines there's plenty of opportunity to do this study now and it really needs to be done. We need to know how long the mRNA is in the blood for, because when it's in the blood, it could carry on producing more and more, more and more antigen, more and more spike protein. And that means that some people could end up with one heck of a lot more spike protein than others, which might not be ideal. Uh, their discussion, they say analysis of mRNA vaccine Function has focused on the immune response. So we've been looking at the immune response and the protection of individuals, not on the longevity of the vaccine in the patient. Initially, of course, we were told it lived for a very short time. We were told it stayed in the arm. Then we learned it most certainly doesn't stay in the arm. It circulates systemically, even if it's given in a muscle. We've just learned it goes to the spleen. If it's given an inadvertently into a vessel, even more so, more systemic uh, distribution. So we've been... We've been looking at the, and we haven't been looking at this. We first, so we first were told it's not systemically absorbed. Now we know it is. Um, then we were told it's only there for a short period of time, or we were told that right at the beginning, and now we know it's not up to twenty-eight days. What else is going to come out? It's a bit of a scandal, actually, uh, in my view. Lipid nanoparticles um, have been reported to be rapidly cleared by immune cells. Well, are they? It would appear not. It would appear not mRNA rapidly degraded, it would appear not. So these, this research shows that these are both falsifiable statements. 
We expect that vaccine mRNA detected in the plasma is contained within lipid nanoparticles. Now, that's what they expect, but they don't know that. So um, an obvious thing to do is check. Now, if there was RNA which is not in the original lipid nanoparticles, that would indicate that there's been replication of the RNA. We need to know the difference. This work should be done and done urgently, in my view. And as we say, in the UK, we're still vaccinating fewer people than we did. We're sort of toning it down on the quiet. But in America, they're still vaccinating lots of people. Coincidentally, Pfizer and Moderna have got labs in the States. Go to work, boys and girls. Get on with it. Not to do so, in my view, would be amiss. Uh, what else have we got? To our knowledge, our study is the first to detect Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna COVID-19 mRNA vaccine sequences in the blood after vaccination. This is quite incredible. We've been doing this, what, for over two years now. And th these the, the persistence of the mRNA in the blood has been found as an incidental finding. Why haven't they been looking for this? It just seems such a fundamental thing not to look for. And yet to the knowledge of these researchers who are very knowledgeable people, um, it's never been done before. Theirs is the first paper to do this. And therefore provide new knowledge regarding the time frame in which mRNA can be detected. You know, I would like to know that. I would like to know that with a larger scale study. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like when they changed from uh, the monovalent to the bivalent vaccine. They didn't even bother doing a human trial. Why are these people not being regulated to make sure they do the research before they give out these vaccines? Then we'll know what we're doing instead of guessing. But there we are. Um, a future perspective study, so they're saying this, uh, to establish the half-life of mRNA vac uh, vaccines in vaccine recipients could be performed. And that could be done remarkably easy. You wouldn't e even need their sophisticated uh, uh, viral uh, genomic analysing equipment that they're using in Denmark. That could be done simply with, with PCR tests, quantitative PCR tests, preferably. So there you go. Um, it could be done easily. It could be done cheaply with PCR tests. Why hasn't it been done? Why did this uh, get discovered as a completely incidental finding in Denmark? And if it had been done in another country, if this had been done in Canada or New Zealand or Australia, I'm just asking myself, thinking out loud now, would this have been published? Would this have ever seen the light of day? Are publications controlled in other countries more than publications are controlled in Denmark? Who knows? Now, um, Asim, um, 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 Asim, a friend, Asim Malhotra has been travelling and he's seen this in, um, he's put this on Twitter, that is seen in uh, the airport in uh, South Africa and of course we'll recognise the late great uh, Nelson Mandela a man who suffered for what he believes in and uh, he said this uh, sometimes one must go public with an idea to push a reluctant organisation in the direction you want to go and uh, that is in the uh, there's a big blow up of that in the uh, airport in South Africa. Um, what a prophetic thing for uh, Nelson Mandela to say. Sometimes one must go public with an idea to push a reluctant organisation to the di in the direction you want to go. The reluctant organisations in his time were obvious. Um, what are the reluctant organisations now? I can't think of any at the moment, but, but maybe you can think of some. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching and thank you, Mr. Mandela, for such an excellent uh, prophetic, uh, prophetic quote.